church. I love, uh, I love the lyric in that last song that says, the king of kings calls me his own. I like that. I like that like choral background. The king of king calls me his own. You guys, there's no greater truth than that. The God created the heavens and the earth says, I want you to be mine. Woohoo! Is that good or what? The world may hate you and your friends may hate you and your family may hate you, but there's one who knows you better than you know yourself. And he says, I want to love you. And I want you to be mine. And that is incredible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys almost sounded charismatic there for a moment. <laughs> Careful. Careful now. Hey, real quick, before we dive into uh, Luke 14, um, we got a, a, a last minute Mexico trip on the calendar in the works. We're working with a local organization called One Mission. They go down to Rocky Point and it's quick, cross the border, build a house for a, a, a needy family. And adults and kids are welcome to go. We need at least 20 people. And I think we're already at that. We'll take more. So if you've got time during spring break, which is the week of March 8th, we're going to head down on a Monday, come back on a Thursday. Um, we're going to do an info meeting at our house this Thursday night uh, at 7 o'clock. So my number's in the insert there. So make sure you let me know you're going to be there, and we'll probably have some coffee. I don't know where we can pick up coffee, but we'll get, we'll get some coffee, uh, maybe have some snacks or something like that. But if you're at all seriously interested, we will unpack every detail of the trip then. Uh, it is going to be fantastic. Here's what I look forward to is working with this organization more. So we'll do more trips, but this is a, a, a first kind of shot in the arm for us to, to go across the, the, the border and just minister to a community where these people are one another. They're kind of their turn to have a house built. A lot of these people don't live in much other than some corrugated metal and some cardboard. And so to actually have a home that you get to pour your blood, sweat, and tears, hopefully more sweat than blood, but pour your blood, sweat, and tears into would be phenomenal. Um, so this Thursday night, our house, seven o'clock. If you can't make it, let me know and I'll make sure you get some additional information. But the sooner we can put a team of at least 20 people together, the better. Great, great trip for adults and kids. We're going to take our kids down, and, uh, and I know there's some other families interested as well. So let me know if you're at all interested. Like I said, my number's in the insert there under Scott Morgan, Pastor Scott, whatever you, you know, you, however you need to get a hold of me. So that's going to be a lot of, lot of fun. So uh, looking forward to, to, to blessing others as we've been blessed. And that's one of our philosophies here at Missio Day. As we've been blessed, we exist to be a blessing to others. Amen? So make sure you, you come to our house this Thursday night at 7 o'clock, and we will talk more about that. So today, we get to talk about, guess what? Food! You know, this is what I love about the Bible. We get to talk about food, and food is precious to God, and food is very precious to me. And if I was to pick one cuisine to eat the rest of my life, you know what it would be? Chinese food. I could eat Chinese food. Matter of fact, I had orange chicken for breakfast this morning. It was amazing. Is that sick? Is that disgusting? Well, I'm praying God works on all your hearts right now. Don't judge. Chinese food is the closest thing to the taste of heaven you'll ever get, all right? So I love Chinese food. Well, there's a Chinese restaurant in Montreal that is being appreciated for their unsparingly honest menu. So if you haven't heard about this restaurant, it, is, uh, it has gone viral because the owner offers his opinions of their own dishes on their menu, and you're going to love the honesty about what they put in their menu about their dishes. He says the orange beef is not that good compared to General Sow's chicken. Yes. Of the satay sauce beef, he writes on the menu, I haven't had a chance to try it yet. <laughs> he says, you know, the orange beef, chicken, don't bother. Can you imagine reading a menu where it's literally trying to steer you away from ordering what's on there? The menu, uh, he says, we're, uh, uh, this one particular dish he has on his menu, this, this chicken dish, he says, we're not 100% satisfied with the flavor now, and it will get better really soon. <laughs> um, and then he says, P.S., under this one chicken dish, he says, P.S., I'm surprised that some customers still order this plate. <laughs> what, 
Wouldn't that be awesome, right? Like when you go out to eat, you're like, look, you're, you're looking for honesty, right? But in the end, you know, really the decision on you. And, and, and in some things, we appreciate honesty. But in vital things, in critical things, don't we kind of demand it? Don't we demand it? If you went to a doctor and you were sick, you, you want that doctor to be honest with you. You went to your boss and you said, hey, I'm really interested in, in improving here at work and doing better. You want honesty. There's, there's certain contexts we demand it. And probably the greatest area we want honesty and we demand it is when it comes to our spiritual lives. Where, where am I at with God? God, God, are we good? How, how am I doing? Right? And sometimes when, when God's honest with us, sometimes we, we shift a little bit in our seats. Don't we? Sometimes when God is honest with us, are, are we really prepared to hear what he has to say to us? There's one thing I know about the ministry of Jesus. Boy, he was honest with people. And sometimes people are like, uh, I didn't need that much honesty, Lord. But yet we need God to be critically vitally honest with us. this passage in in luke 14 and it's really a continuation of, of last week where jesus is brute honest with this group of people who thought they were good with god and they weren't and i love the fact that jesus in his honesty really kind of brings this upheaval to our presumptuousness Here's the thing I want us to be aware of today. That you may not be as good with God as you think you are. Okay? I think there's a little bit of presumptuousness that comes along. And, and we think we're good with God and, and we're really not. And would you want God to be honest with you and say, here's where you're not good with me. Here's, here's what hangs in the balance. Eternity. Eternity. And, and, and I happen to be the messenger today to say, maybe you're not as good with God as you think you are. And we want God to be honest. I want God to be honest with me. Because sometimes I think we can be a bit presumptuous like these religious leaders were. They thought they were good with God. Jesus comes along and says, let me be brutally honest with you. You're not. And so we pick up on last week's message. Look at verse 15 of, of chapter 14 of Luke. So remember, Jesus has said that, you know, to this, this group of people that you're, you guys are approaching God, you're approaching spirituality in all the wrong ways, and you're not as good with God as you think you are. Now, this is a, this is a formal dinner where all these religious leaders have gathered. There's Jesus, and the air is thick with awkwardness. You ever been to a, a party where you just thought, there needs to be a change of topic now? So how about those buccaneers, right? Things are getting a little too, you know, what, go Chiefs, right? right? Anything we can do to turn the topic in a different direction because everyone's feeling a little uncomfortable. So verse 15 says, so some dude at the party reclining at the table with Jesus, here's what Jesus is saying and says to him, blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Like Jesus, instead of, harping on us and being so harsh in, in your tone, can we just all celebrate we're going to be in the kingdom? Verse 16. But he says to him, a certain man was given a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I've married a wife and we want to make love. And for that reason, I cannot come. Oh, your verse doesn't say that. <laughs> I've, 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 kind of, I've kind of enticed you a little bit, didn't I? really what it's about we'll talk about that here in a bit we'll keep it pg-13 okay and the slave came back and reported these excuses to the master and the head of the household the master he became angry 
And he said to his slave, go at once into the streets, to the lanes of the city, bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the slave said, master, what you've commanded has been done and there's still room. And the master said to the slave, go then into the highways along the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Three major points I want to kind of navigate with you this morning. The first is this. There's a prideful reaction. Here's the dude, verse 15, right? Saying things are a little uncomfortable, things are a little awkward. Hey, Jesus, isn't it cool? We're going to be eating together at the table in the kingdom. See, this guy wants to break the silence uh, of, of just this awkwardness with this statement, and literally he's saying, Amen, well said, please pass the mayo. Anything to bring down the level of intensity at this moment. And I'm sure this man's declaration sounded good, but it was insincere. This man is exhibiting a false, false confidence. He's saying to Jesus, we're all going to be there. Wow. In his mind, he's saying, surely the wealthy will be at the table in the kingdom. Surely the religious will be at the table in the kingdom. Surely the popular will be at the table in the kingdom. And Jesus says, not so fast. He's going to test their sincerity. Jesus is going to cut to their hearts because here's what they're concerned about. They're concerned about their position in the kingdom when they should have been concerned about their possession of the kingdom. Think about this. It is easy to fall into categories in our spiritual lives and think of our term, in terms of our relationship with God, as positions. When in reality, the question is, do you possess it? Has it possessed you? And, and Jesus is going to navigate this for us because the parable that he is about to share with us will show us where our true love lies. I'm not so concerned about what you profess. I'm concerned about what you possess. Don't be presumptuous just because you, you walked an aisle when you were eight years old at the Baptist church. Don't be so presumptuous just because you raised your hand at high school camp. Don't be so presumptuous to think, hey, I took communion today. I sang the songs full gusto today. I attend church twice on Sunday, whatever it is. Don't be so presumptuous because the hardest people of the reach are the most spiritual and most religious on the outside. I don't want us to be self-deceived. I don't want us to live in this, this sense of false confidence. I don't want us to be insincere. And neither does Jesus. So we look at this parable called the parable of the great banquet. We get to talk about food. Did I mention that? Oh, yes. But it's not so much about food. Because we think of banquets, we think of feasts, we think of, of big dinners as, as, as something where we get to eat and we get to satisfy our physical appetites. But I want you to know something about the kingdom of God. It is so much more about eating and drinking. The feast in the kingdom of God has more to do with us than just our physical appetites. Here's what the feast of the kingdom of God promises, that every yearning, every longing, every desire we've ever had as human beings will ultimately be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Think about the yearnings and the longings we have to be loved and to love, to be known and to know, to be accepted and to accept all the deepest yearnings and longings and desires that we have as human beings, that many of us have been, we, we've, we've been destroyed because we've looked for satisfaction of things from the things that the world offers and the world can never satisfy us in that way. The feast of the kingdom promises to do this. See, the Jews, 
that Jesus is speaking to understand this because this is, this is something that's been ri- written in the, in the scriptures. God loves the picture of the feast of the kingdom as being that place where every longing, every desire, every yearning of our hearts is deeply satisfied. Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine well refined who's there right like i want that invite but look he's going to swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations he will swallow up death forever Woohoo! and the lord god will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people and if you think that's good it gets better he's going to take away from all the earth for the lord has spoken it will be said on that day behold this is our god we have did for him that he might see this in the Lord. We have worshiped him. Let us be in his salvation. That's the feast. To be so thoroughly known by a God who chooses to show us grace, who chooses to show us mercy, who chooses to show us compassion who would have every right to condemn us apart from his presence, but wants to welcome us us into his presence. Who's excited for that feast? This is what we're talking about. But let's not presume we've got a spot at the table. Let's not presume because of our, our positions and our practices we've got a spot at the table. How will we know we're welcome at the table? Point number two. some will experience a profound rejection. And it has to do what your heart truly loves. Notice this next series of verses has to do with people making excuses. They're going to trade a, a greater love away for a lesser love. What a profound rejection of, of things that we think are going to make us happy right? Uh, look, at, look at verse 16. So he says, and again, Jesus, master at telling these, these parables to, to take these great concepts and communicate them so that people like Scott Moore can, uh, can understand. Thank you, Lord. He says, there's a, there's a man who's going to give a big dinner. He invited many in the dinner hour. He sent his slave to say to those, hey, come for everything is ready. So some, some cultural considerations to, to keep in mind here. Number one, we have to talk about the invitations, because any time a big party like this was thrown, there were two invitations sent out. You ever been to a wedding where they sent you a save the date invitation and then they send you the real invitation? You've seen those, right? This, is, this was customary in this culture. So there's the first invitation sent out. We're going to have a party and we need to know if you're going to be there. Why? Because they didn't have refrigeration. They couldn't just go to Costco. They took time to prepare all the food, so they needed to know the number of guests that were going to be there. So the first invite is this. It's coming. The party is coming. Now, what you need to understand about the first invitation spiritually, it has come through Moses and the prophets. The, the entire Old Testament, 39 books, just in, if you want to just simplify it right now in your minds, the 39 books of the Bible, the first 39 called the Old Testament, it is an announcement. The party is coming. So what Moses and the prophets said, can we count on you to be there? God's, God's preparing a banquet. We need to know based on the first invitation are you planning to be there? And everyone would sit there and go, why wouldn't I go? This is going to be like the party of the century, right? Count me in. Count me in. So that's the first invitation. It's coming. The second invitation is this. It's completed. We're ready. The second invitation is Jesus. See, the first invitation was Moses and the prophets pointing to the fact that there's a great banquet being prepared. Can we count on you to be there? Everyone says, sounds like a great time. Count me in. 
And then when the second invite rolls around, because again, there weren't text messages, there wasn't email, there wasn't, there was a servant running around to all the people who had said yes, time to get ready, let's go. The banquet's ready. Here's the problem. Those who RSVP'd yes to the law and the prophets ultimately end up saying no to Jesus. How's the banquet host feel at this moment? I spent how much on chicken wings? I got how much tequila? <laughs> what? You're, guess what? You spend that much money and that much time preparing, and all of a sudden, one guest after another who originally said they're going to be there makes excuses not to be there. See, the first invitation reflected the Old Testament desire that said, Psalm 2, right? Be prepared to kiss the Son. This is what the banquet's about, to kiss the Son. But once the second invitation is sent out, the kissing has turned into killing. We're no longer going to go to the, the party. And they come up with lame excuses. Who's guilty of coming up with a lame excuse of, to try to avoid a party in your life, right? Here's the one thing God does not want you to do today and for the rest of your life. Come up with a lame excuse to avoid you meeting with him. See, we move now from the invitations to the excuses. This is where we need to do some, some soul searching, some heart examining, because I don't want you to miss the big dinner. I don't want you to miss the big dinner. And so these excuses, and there's really two, really kind of encompass anything we could come up with in our lives. And, and you may find yourself saying, I've used that excuse before with God. And, they, and they, the excuses fall into two categories. Either they have to do with material possessions or they have to do with earthly relationships. Notice there's three excuses. One guy says, I've got some land I'm looking to invest in and I can't make it because I need to go examine the property. The second guy says, I've bought 10 head of oxen, five yoke, two to a yoke, 10 oxen, 20,000 pounds of meat. I need to go check out these animals. And then the third guy says, man, I got this hot wife and I just don't want to leave the bedroom. If you think about it, the, two, the excuses fall into two categories. One being, I have too much to do. And the second one being, I need to focus on my family. While they may be good things to focus on, too many people make them ultimate things to focus on. So I want to navigate this with you, and I want to, and I want to be, I want to be as, as, as in line with what Christ is saying to these people and trying to make it relevant to us, because here's what I understand as a pastor as I talk to people. It is always heartbreaking when people, people will say yes to things that will ultimately break their hearts and they're saying no to the things that will ultimately heal their hearts. It is always difficult when you hear people say no to a perpetual feast of peace in their lives. It is hard to hear people say no to a perpetual feast of help in their lives, guidance in their lives, friendship in their lives, rest in their lives, victory over self in their lives, control over passions in their lives, joy, tranquility, deathlessness, hope, ultimately salvation. You cannot come up with an excuse that is better than salvation. I dare you, somebody, right now. You can't do it. There is nothing more important than tending to where your soul is before God. We're not here saying work is not important. We're not here to say that owning things is not important. We're not here to say that your relationships are not important. But when those things hinder you from what's most important, that is you and God, 
those things can be destructive things. Can I get an amen from somebody? So let's, 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 let's tease this out a little bit deeper. So first, material possessions. I have too much to do. There's, there's two guys, right? There's the landowner and then there's the livestock dealer, right? This is involving business and work and possessions. And, and let's be honest, sometimes business and work can become an idol. God wants us to work. He wants us to enjoy our work. This guy, though, is so absorbed with his business dealings, he sees this as his primary objective in life. God's good, but God's on the back burner. God's good, but he's in the passenger seat. It is his business. It is his work. He has a home and family to care for. But here's the problem, and here's why his excuse is flimsy. No one would buy land without first checking it out. No one would buy land without first walking the property. No one would buy land with making sure, how's the drainage of the property? What, what, where are the mountains? Where are the trees? What, what sort of stuff am I dealing with? So it's a really, really lame excuse that's keeping this man from going to the banquet. The second guy is interested in livestock. And, and, and he's going to buy 10 head of oxen which means, number one, he's wealthy. And number two, he's adding to his already accumulation of possessions. Now, here's the problem with possessions. We end up thinking we're possessing them and they end up possessing us. Amen? The stuff that we accumulate ends up becoming our idols. Here's this guy anxious to try out his purchases and no one would buy 10 head of oxen without first seeing how they do in the field. What do they even look like? I mean, do they look like lean cuisine steaks or are they really beef fatty cows? It's almost like me saying, you know, hey, babe, I'm not going to be home tonight because I bought five cars on Craigslist and I don't even know what they look like if they have time or if they'll crank over. (laughs) It's pretty stupid, isn't it? Now, again, lest we criticize them, these, these people are trying to meet basic human needs, right? Food, shelter, water, et cetera. But the problem is when you try to chase a career, try to chase a job, try to chase owning things without God involved. We do not build houses apart from God. We do not build careers apart from God. We do not buy things apart from God. There are no good excuses for skipping the banquet. Second thing is earthly affections. Earthly affections, earthly relationships. I need to focus on my family. I need to focus on my boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, kids, whatever. Again, not that those things are not important, but here's here's lover boy. Look, verse verse 20, another one said, I'm married, and therefore I cannot come. Now, in the Old Testament, marriage would make you exempt from serving in the military for one year. Said nothing about staying in the sack with your honey. And literally, that's what the guy says. He says, hey, I'm more interested in my new wife. I've just recently been married, and I desire to spend more time with her. And it is always, always sad when the vows that you make before God now keep you from God. It is always dangerous when the bridegroom of heaven comes to take his bride, the church, and we're in, unwilling to interrupt our earthly marriage that we're already enjoying at the expense of enjoying the spiritual, eternal, heavenly marriage that God wants for us. For better or for worse, our spouse often has become the most influential person in our lives under heaven and not our love for God. You can you see how a good thing can become, become a destructive thing? Do any of your relationships keep you from feasting with the Lord? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to consider something. I want you to be involved in people's lives, and especially those people that are far from Jesus. But if there are toxic people in your life that are keeping you from feasting in Christ, you need to reevaluate those relationships. Can I get an amen from somebody? Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Someone needs to hear This, that if our spouse or kids or parents or friends consume our lives consciously or unconsciously, they will rob us of what we need to do to love them well, and that is God. Do you think about this? 
Don't let any love you enjoy below be an excuse for your love for what's above. There's nothing wrong with owning a business. There's nothing wrong with owning possessions. There's nothing wrong with having a hot wife. I know this. <laughs> but, but let me, let, please hear what I, what I am saying. If the good, oh, I like the cue on that. Yeah. Let's <laughs> if the good things become more important than the best things, then it all ends up being a bad thing. Sometimes you have to say no to a good thing in order to say yes to God's best. We wish it was so black and white, good and evil, like we just know, like good and bad. And sometimes the things in life that distract us the most are, are they're, they're good things. But they rob us from focusing on ultimate things. See, you can be successful in the eyes of the world with all the things we've just talked about and be a failure in the eyes of Jesus because you want those things at the expense of having him. Here, here's the question. Do you want Jesus more than you want anything else? This, this is not Pastor Scott issuing this. It's Jesus. Do you want him more than you want anything else. No wonder more people walked away from Christ than followed him. When you issue those kind of demands, Matthew 13, verse 44, when a man finds, he, the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a treasure in a field. And he gladly, he joyfully goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Are, are you that person? Do you want God more than you want anything else? Because here's, here's something maybe you haven't con considered and I want you to really think about. It's not that God doesn't want you to have a career. It's not that God doesn't want you to be married or have kids or have hobbies and have possessions. But do you realize that when you have Jesus first and then you pursue all those other things, they actually become better? Write this down. This is a Scott Morgan original. Tweet this out. This is good. Jesus makes everything better. <laughs> you like it? Yeah. I think we can print t-shirts and put ball caps together or something. Jesus makes everything better. We think living without Jesus, things are good. And they may be, but guess what? <laughs> you have no idea. You have not tasted the goodness of God while he's not involved in every area of your life. Think about this, you guys. With Jesus involved, the field that this man wants to buy will be better tended. With Jesus involved in your life, the oxen will be better utilized. With Jesus in your life, the, the wife will be more tenderly and sacredly loved. And of course, C.S. Lewis <laughs> encapsulates this in a masterful way, I did not quote Lewis last week, so I at least deserve two Lewis, Lewis quotes today. I'll give you one. To love you as I should, I must worship God as creator. He's writing this to his wife. To love you as I should, I must worship God as creator. When I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving towards the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. Is that awesome? We, we tend to to compartmentalize our lives, bifurcate our lives, segment our lives, categorize our lives as if God's not involved in every aspect and we think we're going to get out of this and be okay. God wants to be involved in your career. He wants to be involved in your finances. He wants to be involved in your sex life. He wants to be involved in your hobbies. He wants to be involved in how you watch sports. Go team today. Because that's where most of us feel. 
We don't care. We just hope it's a good game. God wants to be involved in every aspect of our life. Why? Because the things we put our hearts into are things that we are longing and yearning and desiring to find meaning and purpose and significance in. Don't you dare pursue those things without God involved. When God is involved first, all the other things become magnified in ways where you think, how can I leverage these things for eternity? How can I leverage these things for eternal significance? Do you you understand how important this is? Their excuses show where their hearts are at. And the real reason people turn away from the eternal feast is that they do not want to be there. They have no appetite for higher things. And can I tell you, as a pastor, I've wrestled with this. (laughs) I I plead, I beg, I get all bug-eyed. Some of you get scared when I get all bug-eyed because I see people settle for less. And I mourn and I grieve and I cry over people who are settling for cheap substitutes. How's that artificial sweetener working out for you? There's no substitute. There is a world-renowned musician that lives here in the valley. Multi-platinum recording artist. You would know his name if I mentioned, but I'm not going to mention his name. He has a house in Paradise Valley. He has a home where in the basement is this like recording studio and all the platinum albums. And there's a group of of high school kids that were at his house because this guy has come to know Jesus. And it's really, really cool. His wife came to know Jesus first and then ultimately was able to see her husband come to know to love Jesus. And so here's this youth group at this guy's house. And they're all like platinum albums. And I'm like, and you know what he said? He turned to them. He said, I would gladly turn all this in to have one day more with Jesus. To have come to know him more. Mic drop. Like, think about it. This man has come to a place in his life where he says all the success, all the fame, all the notoriety, all the, the millions of dollars he would gladly trade for one day more to know Jesus. What are you going to give up for Christ? What are you going to sacrifice for, for Christ? What has crept into your life and is preventing you from not only loving him, but walking with him? Because you're not going to sit there and tell me any excuse that I'm going to go, you know what, you're right. I'm going to change my message. It's, it's all or none. I mean, th- again, this is not me. This is Jesus. He's the one saying, you're going to have to make a choice. This world or the kingdom. What's it going to be? And I wish I could tell you it, it, it's one decision you make one time and the rest of your life is good. Here's the work of God in our hearts and here's the walk of discipleship. Daily. Saying, you, Jesus, are first and foremost and most important. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and all the other stuff will take care of itself. What have you allowed to take first place that's not the kingdom that needs to go back to second place? Because if you don't make those choices on a daily basis, it is going to be harder tomorrow to make those decisions than it is today. Why are you settling for breadcrumbs when the banquet is prepared for you? Here's the good news. Last point. Promised reality. Here's, <laughs> I, lo- I, I, I love how this, so the host, verse 21, becomes angry. And does he have a right? 
Yeah. I mean, even before God destroys the world with the flood in Genesis, he says, my heart is sad that men and women have chosen to reject me. The sinfulness of mankind just rampant. We have a God who feels and he connects. And to have his offer of relationship rejected, but, but here's the good news, is that there is rejection by some, but there's acceptance by others. And, and here's the good news, is right, that th- the party that's happening involves us. And if, and if you just consider yourself, you're like, what, why would I even have a spot at the table? And you need to know, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what color your skin is, no matter how, how you vote, no matter which team you root for in the Super Bowl, there's a spot for you at God's table. Here, here's the thing. So the, ho- the, the party planner host becomes angry, and then what does he say? Go out. Because this party is going to continue. Here's what I love about the work of God. You can reject all you want. That's on you. The party is going forward. Will you be there? Will you be there? Look what he says. He says to the servant, go out into the streets, verse 21, and to the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the slave said, all right, I've done that, but there's still room. Go out further. Go out to the highways and the hedges and to the, to the, to the other people way out there and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you that none of those men who were invited right, the ones who said yes to the first invitation, who said no to the second invitation, I'll be at my dinner. Notice the phrase, my dinner. This is not your dinner. This is Jesus' dinner. So consider this, if you would, with me. There's two things here. There's a declaration of rejection, meaning you reject it on you. But don't you think God's gonna wait around? God does not bow down to your timetable and say, oh, you know, I'll just wait around for you to get your life together. And he says, if you reject me, that will ultimately lead to an ultimate rejection by me. But the party will continue. So not only is Jesus declaring to the people sitting at the table right now that think they're in, right, because of their presumptuousness, they're not in. He says, I've rejected you. But it's also a declaration of celebration. Come on, right? Guys, I didn't deserve a spot at the table, and for some reason, God in his grace has allowed me to be seated there. How about you? Are you you at the table yet? Because if not, I'm going to try to convince you right now to be at the table. See, the master decides, however, the party's going to go on. Nothing's to be delayed. The promised celebration will be held as announced. And who ends up being at the table? There's one word that describes everyone that's seated at the table, and it is this, broken. Everyone who's at God's table are broken people. Because it's not the healthy who need a physician. It's those who are sick. See, the guys that Jesus is speaking to think they're good. We're healthy. We don't need a doctor. And essentially what they're saying is we don't need God. We got this. You're going to trust your own righteousness? You're going to trust your own good works? You're going to trust your own life of purity? And good luck with that because you've already failed today in the last 30 minutes. See, brokenness is required for you to have a place at the table. Let me rephrase it. The only response that gets you to be at God's banquet is a response of repentance. You know why Jesus emphasizes the lame and the crippled and the blind? It's because these people know they don't measure up. They know they don't deserve. They've been told by outsiders and the religious community that there must be something wrong with you there must be some sin in you you just need to get your life together and they are offered no assistance no help and so they're left in a life of hopelessness and yet they get an invitation to be at the table and notice the word in verse 23 which i love compel 
Because here's why you have to compel them, because they're not going to believe the message at first. They've been told all their life they can never be loved by God. They've been told all their life that they would never have a seat at the banquet table. They've been told all their life that they're sinners and the sin that they have inside has affected their life and they cannot be rescued. They cannot be forgiven. They cannot be made whole. And you have to convince them. It may take 15 minutes. It may take 15 hours. It may take 15 days. But you continue to press in on them and let them know that they are welcome because it's an offer too good to be true. That's right, so what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. He, he says that I'm going to, I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'm going to make my, his appeal, God's appeal through me, right? We're going to implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Implore, compelled, convinced. How many of you still find it hard to believe that God could love you? How many of you even take that message to others and, and let them know that God loves them and you just know they don't believe it? This is how destructive sin is. It leaves us on our own and it leaves us without God and it leaves us hopeless. And that's why we are ambassadors. We are messengers because if you've tasted the goodness of God, you know that you can be forgiven. And now we're called to go out to the highways and the byways, the hedges and the, and the streets, and to let all people know. People need convincing because they're aware of their own brokenness and they're aware of their own fallenness and they're aware of their own need. But God loves us so much that he's not going to leave us there. You know why all these people ultimately say Yes. Because the blind don't go to examine their farmland. And the crippled don't go plow with their oxen. And the poor aren't invited to hang out with the rich and the lame and the maimed. They don't get married. Who wants them? They say yes because when they hear the invitation, they hear it say to them that they are welcome. And this is the greatest message, the greatest treasure they could ever hear. And so they are broken and they respond with repentance. And they are there because they don't deserve to be there. And the moment you think you deserve to be there, you're not there. Heaven is not a banquet filled with prideful, arrogant, boastful people. Heaven is is filled with people who will cry out for eternity. Worthy is the lamb that was slain for me. Grace is the song of eternity. Grace is invincible, number one, and grace is incredible, number two. You guys, the world is dying to experience grace. Number one, grace is invincible. Grace will continue to move forward and change men and women's lives, with or without you. The party's going to take place, and there's no way you can frustrate what God is doing in defeating the sin in people's lives, right? But if I was to change Jesus' uh, phrase in Matthew 16, remember where Jesus says, you know, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You need to understand this, that Christ will build his church and the disdain and unbelief of men and women will never be able to stop it. Your rejection or resistance won't stop it. You will either ride the wave and join God on this, on this journey of grace or you will be crushed by it. And you will spend eternity wishing you would have accepted his grace. When in reality you rejected it, and I wasn't planning on number two quote by C.S. Lewis, but you've heard me say this before, the doors of hell are locked on the inside. You choose your destination. So, so I'm hearing this message today. And I need, I need to understand, and I want you to understand that the, the grace of God is ever, ever with us and among us and changing us and convicting us 
and reminding us daily that we do not deserve it, but we get it. I'm not sitting at that table going, boy, I'm glad I did what I did to be here. I'm broken. Isaiah 55 says, I'm naked and I'm poor and I'm powerless and yet I get to taste the best food and drink the best wine. You there? Are you there with me? And, and here's what we can celebrate. Point number two, right? Grace is incredible. It seems too good to be true, doesn't it? God's house is going to be filled with or without you. Take some time for that to sink in. And yet we need to never, ever get over grace. Can I remind? Here's one reason you, here's one way you can keep the message of grace fresh in your life. Just, just dive into God's word daily. Spend time with him and listen to his voice. And, and you'll be, I feel for people who are part of church culture who neglect the word of God and the spirit of God in their lives. Because when the voice of grace disappears, the voice of performance and the voice of legalism steps in. And, and it is a wicked mistress. You, you don't want to settle for that. Be broken and he will lift you up. Be broken and he will heal you. There's a, uh, I read an interesting story. So, this, so I mentioned Ronald Reagan. Many would consider one of the greatest presidents ever. I would fall in that category. Uh, when he was governor during the Vietnam War, he got a letter, governor of California, uh, a GI serving in, uh, in Vietnam sends him a letter. It says, my wife and I, our anniversary is coming up. And I sent her a letter, but I don't know if that letter will get to her by my anniversary, by our, by our anniversary. Would you perhaps, just to cover my bases, would you be so kind to give her a phone call? <laughs> just give her a call. Say, hey, your husband wanted me to call you. He's thinking about you, loves you, adores you. Now, number one, I love that. Um, this is written by Reagan's personal assistant named Michael Dever. You can actually read a book of 30 years this man spent with Ronald Reagan. Reagan got that note. He marked on his calendar anniversary day. And this person's information, they lived in Orangevale, California. Reagan on anniversary day for this GI and his wife left the office early, went and picked up a dozen red roses, went to her house, sat down, sipped coffee, discussed their kids. For an <laughs> Is that awesome? <laughs> I mean, a phone call from the governor would have been totally satisfactory. But flowers and a visit stretches our belief, doesn't it? This is what grace does. You never get over it. Because our God daily doesn't look to do the bare minimum. He goes beyond to let you know you are loved and you are his. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, we are humbled once again that you would enter into our world, your world, and seek to rescue a bunch of lost people. Some of us don't know we're lost. But yet, there will come a bitter end thinking that we're okay without you. But there's many of us who have recognized that we have nothing. 
and we need you. That is the message of the cross. That is the message of the great redemption work of Jesus. You have bought us back from the slave market of sin and now brought us into the wonderful family of your righteousness. And not only are we a part of your family, but there is an eternal feast set before us that will ultimately be consummated one day. We can't wait for that day. In the meantime, keep our appetites for you. Keep our yearnings and our longings for you, Jesus. May we never settle for second loves, but may we have one primary affection, and that is our hearts connected to Christ. And help us deepen not only the relationship with you, but the continual message of grace. Thank you, God, that we could ever do to make you love us more and there's nothing you could ever do to make us we could ever do to make you love us less you love us perfectly today and forever and it's all because of jesus thank you for such an amazing savior thank you that the king of kings and lord of lords now calls us his own to you be the glory forever and ever in christ's name we pray amen May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. You guys, love you. Have a great day, all right? We'll see you soon. Go sports. Go sports.